Uh, tonight we have a very special evening. Uh, we are very, very lucky and very, very honoured uh, that Lady Rose, Justice of the United Kingdom Supreme Court, is here to talk to us tonight um, about the path of her uh, career. And she's going to have a fireside chat with our very own uh, Professor Sir Ross Cranston. Um, and they'll talk for how long are you planning to talk for? About 50 minutes. About 50 minutes, and then we'll open the floor to questions. So, uh, Ross, Lady Rose, over to you. Well, thanks very much, David. Um, this is actually part of the Legal Biography Project, and we've been running this at the LSE for about 20 years. And during that time, we've interviewed a number of judges. We started with Lord Bingham. Um, we moved through a number of judges, Lady Arden, um, Baroness Hallett, and a number of foreign judges as well. Um, Edwin Cameron from South Africa, um, the ju uh, Judge uh, Barr from uh, Germany. But tonight, as David has said, we're very lucky. We've got um, Lady Rose. Now, I've apologized in advance for her, to her, because I've known her for quite a long time, and I will probably call her Vivian during the course of the, uh, during the, course of the interview. But uh, she said that that's all right. Um, so thanks very much, um, Lady Rose. Um, we've put this up. Do you want to explain that? There's, there you're photographed. It, it's actually in Parliament Square. I don't think a lot of the students will know that particular statue there, but yes. you're there and you're with the I'm there statue. splendidly dressed in my very bling uh, Justice of the Supreme Court robes, and that was on the day of my swearing in as a Supreme Court Justice on the 19th of April uh, 2021. And we have a photo shoot after the, um, after the swearing-in ceremony with my guests and with the other members of the court. And then I particularly asked if we could uh, move outside and take that photograph of me standing next to Millicent Garrett Fawcett. She was, uh, as the uh, um, statue suggests, courage calls to courage everywhere, she was a great suffragette, suffragist, uh, and she was also particularly dear to my heart because she was one of the founders of Newnham College at Cambridge, which has just celebrated its 150th anniversary. And she was one of the founding members of that college. Um, and so I very much wanted to have my picture taken with her on this significant day in my life. Uh, and it's a wonderful statue if you haven't been to have a look at it yet in Parliament Square. I think she's the first woman to have her statue in that very august place. And as you can see round the plinth, there are uh, ceramic tiles with photographs on them of other women who were active in that movement, who were uh, active in the fight for women's franchise. Um, and so that was very special to me to have that done. It's a great photograph, and you've got the sun as well. Yes, we were very fortunate. My, my um, swearing-in had to be postponed for a week because of the period of mourning for the late Prince Philip. Uh, but in fact, we did have lovely weather, so that yes. was uh, an advantage. I guess I have to ask you, Vivian, are you a feminist? Yes, I would count myself as a feminist. I don't think you can necessarily have successful careers I've had. Um, without having quite a strong view that women are just as able to do these difficult jobs as men and should be given the chance to show that they can. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is part of the Legal Biography Project, so I have to take you back to the very beginning. And where you were born and grew up and went to primary school? I was born and have lived pretty much all my life, really, in North London. So London are born and bred. Uh, and I went to primary, local primary school there and also then went on to comprehensive school uh, nearby in walking distance. Um, so we lived uh, in a little house in Queensbury um, where my parents had moved when they came down to London. My father worked for Marks and Spencers in their head office so that was quite convenient for his commute. And we lived in that house from the time I was born till the time I was in my early 20s. Yeah. Can you say something about your father? Because uh, there's an interesting story yes. about your father. My father and, and 
his family? Yes, my father and his parents and his sister came to this country as refugees from the Nazis in the late 1930s. And he had, as many Jews had, a very narrow escape, but fortunately did manage to get out in time. Uh, and he came with his, his family, uh, and I think he was about 14 when he arrived here. And by the time he was 18, the war was underway, uh, and he got a place to study at the LSE. He wanted to study economics, and at that time the LSE was evacuated from central London to Cambridge and they all lived in Peterhouse College in Cambridge. Uh, so he had a very strong connection with the LSE, and throughout his life he very proudly wore the blazer with the insignia on the, uh, on the pocket. Um, and he also had a strong connection with, with Cambridge as well. So as a child we used to go up there every Easter break and punt down the river, a skill he had acquired there. I don't think I can see any blazers here. <laughs> but it would be a collector's item, I'm sure. Yes, well, it was well I worn. Don't get blazers these days. No, but it's been. Anyone got the fever on them? Fever insignia. Because I think those blazers used to have. Yes, the fever they on did. Them. It was all embroidered very beautifully. Goodness knows what happened to it. So he was, he was very proud of He was very LSE proud connection. of his LSE connection, and he was a, a lifelong learner. Uh, so when he retired from Marks and Spencer's, he went back to Birkbeck College, actually, and did part-time degree. Um, uh, I think he did an MA in economics, and then he studied, um, he was very interested in, my parents were very interested in ballet, so he did a um, postgraduate qualification in not performing, but in uh, studying ballet and the dance yes, form. Yes. And what about your mother? My mother was a, had graduated from Manchester University, which is um, where they had met. Uh, and she didn't pursue a career. It was quite rare for a woman to do that in those days. And I think she, she was slightly frustrated that she was very bright, um, but she uh, stayed at home and looked after my, me and my two sisters. Yes, it's not an unfamiliar story. Yes, that generation. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so you do have siblings? Yes, I have an older sister and a younger sister, and we're very different physically and emotionally and temperamentally, but we get on extremely well. I'm very close to them both, yes. But you're the middle. I'm the middle child, yes. There's a whole psychology, isn't there, about the middle child? There is, <laughs> yes. We won't go into well, it. I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't do to probe these things. Okay. But was it a happy childhood? Yes, I think it was reasonably happy. Um, I think it, it gave me the building blocks for the person I am in the sense that my parents were very hard-working, they believe very strongly in education as a way of progressing. I think that's a common thing with refugee families as well. Um, they work very hard, they encouraged us to study hard, they, we didn't have much money but they were very keen that you should live within your means. Um, and they also had a great love of the theatre as well as ballet and they certainly passed that on to me. I love going to the theatre as well. Yeah. So. You, you said earlier that you went to the local primary school and then you went to yes. a comprehensive school yes. in northwest London, uh, Kingsbury School. Kingsbury High School, yes. Yeah. Any Kingsburyans here? No. Okay. <laughs> But yes, it was, it was a very good school. It had, it had um, merged a few years before my older sister went there. It was a merger of a grammar school and a secondary modern. Um, but it was a very good school. I was very happy there. All three of us went there. Um, and yes. what about your sort of favourite subjects? I studied, I loved English literature uh, and I studied French and history for A-level, and I did quite a range of topics for um, for what was O-levels then, GCSEs now, but my parents were very humanities-oriented. Um, I'm sure they would have supported me if I'd been a budding scientist, but it was unlikely to be the case, yeah. I think. And, and what about uh, you know, particular teachers? 
that had uh, an influence? Or yes, I helped? think they were, they were very dedicated, the staff, particularly because I stayed on for a seventh term to do Cambridge entrance exams in English literature. And uh, the school was, did teach to a very high standard, and every year there were one or two people who did Oxbridge entrance. Um, uh, and I took the exams in English literature, and the, the staff were, were wonderful, really. They gave up their free periods to teach me what I needed to know beyond the A-level syllabus in order to have a chance of doing the exam. I also, they were at school in those days, there were a lot of extra things, so I always sang. I've always been a co sing, sung in choirs ever since I was a child and through school, through university and throughout my adult life. Um, and there was a school orchestra and there was also a lot of um, amateur dramatics. We used to put on productions of musicals and plays. and So I really enjoyed that aspect of social side of school as well. Are you still singing? I still sing, yes. I do Not sing. Not the Supreme Court? No, there, I think there used to be a choir, Westminster Choir, but I think it's, I don't think it's come back after the pandemic. Yeah. I think you've told other people that you wanted to be a, actually a barrister, not mm. simply a lawyer, but a barrister at a very young age. Yes. Where did this come I from? I don't know where it, where it came from, but I almost can't remember a time when that wasn't my ambition. Had you seen something on television? I must have or? seen something on television. I just always knew from the age of about 13, 14 that that was what I wanted to do. Um, and so I kind of was quite single-minded in my pursuit of that. And that's why I studied law at university. If I'd known maybe that I was going to be a lawyer for the whole of my life, <laughs> um, maybe I'd done, uh, done something else. But I did enjoy law as an academic <laughs> subject, so I don't, don't regret it. Not discouraging you from making that choice. No, it's careful, a great subject. Be careful about this. Yes, you? yes. You know. I did, no, I did love law. I remember, yes, the very early days as a student, starting to read cases and thinking this is these little novellas of fact patterns they just always delighted and fascinated me from this little story of an unhappy situation is spun out these legal principles yeah. you told us earlier about in college and that's mm. where you went mm. um, you actually applied for that college, didn't you? I did, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you did law. Um, now, you have to be rather careful with this answer because you've got a number of law teachers here. But what law teachers were especially influential? Or were they influential at all? I think they were because they really uh, put across their own interest in the subject. I think the Cambridge course is a very practical course that teaches you a lot of actual substantive law and it really teaches you to look at legislation, to look at case law and, and they, the lectures were very intensively focused on well these are the cases and this is what happened and this is what was decided um, and, and that I think has influenced my practical approach to legal study and the application of the law. Um, I hope the students are taking this in. Yeah. Read the case. Read the cases. Carefully. Oh, well, that's, that's the pleasure of it, really, I think. But, um, what so, about yes, the yes, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think the, I was taught by Len Seeley, taught me company law. Um, I remember DGT Williams lecturing us in constitutional Law and he was a great public lawyer. Public lawyer. Student, and in yeah. one of the first lectures, um, he read out that great passage from Lord Atkin's dissent in Liversidge and Anderson, you know, amid the class, clash of arms, the laws are not silent. And I just had still send shivers down my spine to hear that. And it was, I just remember thinking, this is a, a marvelous thing that I'm going to become part of. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever lost that thrill of it. Yeah. So you did, you finished there at Cambridge mm. and then you decided to do postgraduate work and 
you have to be a bit careful here because, um, as you acknowledged earlier, Professor Hugh Collins was your moral tutor. <laughs> and you... he taught me a bit, I think, collective bargaining. You went, me, yeah. you went to Oxford, but I why did. didn't you come to London to do your LLM? Or well, stay was, at Cambridge? Well, I was or... all set, it was just a, a, one of those kind of accidental things, which I think has a lesson in it, which is I was all set up to do the uh, Cambridge LLM as it was, but I wasn't entirely thrilled with the um, choice of topics that were on offer and it was really a chance conversation trying to think of something to say when I was stood in next to Richard Fentiman who then was just starting at Cambridge um, uh, in, when we were both waiting for the photocopier and uh, he, was, he, was he, was, he was teaching yeah. then at Queen's. He just arrived to teach at Queen's and was teaching me conflict of laws. Um, and I said, I'm, he asked, you know, what are you doing after finals? I said, well, I'm thinking of uh, staying on to do the LLM here, but I'm not entirely thrilled about it. And he said, what well, have you thought of doing the BCL in Oxford? And then it all just happened very quickly because this was quite late in the day. Um, but he, I think, must have rung up uh, Hugh and um, or whoever was in charge, and it was all kind of sorted out very quickly. And I remember ringing up my parents. In those days, you had to queue for the payphone. There was no such thing as mobile phones. I remember talking to my mother for our weekly chat and said, it seems I'm going to Oxford next year. <laughs> um, and so it, it, did, it did just happen by accident. But it was a, a matter of just being open to that opportunity and in fact it turned out to be an extremely significant step in my life for reasons which I couldn't have foreseen at the time. And you did competition law? That was when I first, yes, yeah. that was when I first studied competition law. I'd studied it a little bit just in a couple of weeks of the EU law course and I'd enjoyed it and so I went to study that. I mean, uh, uh, we, uh, you went on a scholarship, I think, or the, uh, 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 a grant. Yes. I mean, students these days don't get these grants, unfortunately, but we were in a privileged generation. We were a very privileged generation, yes. And um, yes, so having been educated at the state's expense at school and then three years, all fees paid and grant, living grant at Cambridge and then at Oxford and then the bar finals. I've paid it back in taxes over the years, but um, it was there when I needed it, yes. Yeah. So you, you finish at Oxford. Um, I should say, of course, you got first in both, uh, both Cambridge and Oxford. And you're then a pupil barrister and you're, you're, you're looking for pupillage and you end up at what are now called Moncton Chambers, yes. which are a are set that do competition law, but also EU, EU law. They do EU um, law generally, mm. and uh, at that time they did uh, quite a bit of uh, general commercial law, and they also had a very different personal injuries uh, practice because David Kemp was the head of Chambers, and he was the author of this encyclopedia of all those Kemp, Kemp and Kemp, where they, there was this, it was um, loose leaf, uh, encyclopedia where people would write in about what damages have been awarded for different accidents so in this book you could you know look up legs and they would start with someone who'd had their legs severed and then it would go down to someone who sort of strained their knee and you would there would be all these how much it was worth in fact and uh, yes yeah, so because of him there was quite a strong personal injuries practice yeah but uh, i mean during pupillage and then subsequently in the early years you didn't do that sort of work you oh i did yes we oh, all did yes yeah. as, a, as a junior you do a bit of everything yes i did a lot of advising on quantum and liability of personal injuries work um so the work as is quite common with a junior barrister. It's a mixture of being a junior in a mega case where you have a more senior barrister and a KC now, QC then, on top and you're doing the sort of running around work and then your own much smaller work which, which you do for yourself, either just advisory work or drafting pleadings or going to court. Yeah. I sort of jumped ahead. Mm. 
because you'd have to get tenancy as you do yes, as a barrister. Yes. And they offered you a tenancy at, at Edmonton. They did, yes. It was quite different in those days because um, you didn't get paid anything as a pupil. So chambers, we were just kind of free labour really. So chambers, sets of chambers would take on eight, nine, ten pupils each year. Did you have to pay at that stage? No, I'm not that old. Um, <laughs> uh, no, they, they'd given up stage, you having to pay. As a pupil, you had to pay. Yes, you had to pay for the privilege. Um, no, so I didn't have to pay, but I didn't get paid anything. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I got um, scholarships from Gray's Inn to fund me through that. Um, and uh, so I was a, I, I was a pupil in a, did my first six in a set where um, at the end of the first six months we were all sent away because they'd taken on three pupils from the cohort above us and didn't have any more room. So then I was slightly scrabbling around for a place to go but I went to Moncton and after six months they did offer me a tenancy. And you had a couple of um, prominent pupil masters or people who later became prominent Yes, um, yes, in, in, uh, in Moncton, yes. Yeah. I, my first pupil master was um, Richard Buxton, who then became a judge and a, just, a Lord Justice of Appeal, in the Court of Appeal, and then Christopher Bellamy, now Lord Bellamy, who um, went from Chambers to become a, court, uh, a judge in the, what's now the General Court in Luxembourg, and then came back to London to set up the Competition Appeal Tribunal. And so they were, a yes, minister. yes, and is now a government yeah. minister. Um, so they were both, they were very influential, both because they were pupil masters and also they were a great help to me in my first few years in chambers, getting me instructed in their cases and helping me make a go of it. And so you started to appear in some of the big competition cases. Yes. Uh, led, for example, by Jeremy Lieber, who yes. was one of the great figures in, in competition law. Um, and you actually appeared in the House of Lords a couple of times. Yes, I did. Um, one of those was actually being led by Stephen Richards, who at that time was doing a lot mm -hmm. of government work, um, who was also a great uh, supporter. Um, and that was about quite a technical thing about the meaning of agreements in the statute um, that uh, applied at that time, uh, the competition regime. And I was also uh, led by Jeremy Lever in a case about um, pharmaceutical companies, which was a very formative experience for me, both as a barrister and as a judge, because one of the law lords, and this obviously was when it was in the House of Lords rather than the Supreme Court, um, who had better remain nameless, was a terrible bully. He had a bad reputation and he was very rude, very aggressive, constantly interrupting. Um, and it was just excruciating for everybody in the room to see and of course for poor Jeremy and we had so carefully prepared his submissions in what we thought was a logical order to get across what were very complicated concepts and he just couldn't make it happen. He couldn't present his submissions constantly being interrupted and badgered. And at the end of it, Jeremy um, said what he forgets is that this, yes, it's a committee room of the House of Lords, but it's also our workplace. We're all here doing our job. He's here doing his job. I'm here doing my job there, all the solicitors, the clients. This is a workplace and that kind of behavior wouldn't be tolerated on the factory floor, in the staff room, um, or in an office. And there's no reason why he should think that it's acceptable here but that wasn't the kind of zeitgeist at the time it is very much now yeah. um, you're very kind to counsel now yes i'm very kind to even counsel always totally wrong even well um but it, it's very important that that the barristers not only because it helps them give of their best but also the client is there and they're 
want to make sure that they can see that the barrister has got the submissions across. So um, that was quite a bruising experience. Yes. Well, he had, a, he had that reputation. He did. Yeah. There were some yeah. who were horrors, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, he wasn't the other one. The one. <laughs> um, you then became standing counsel to the Office of Fair Trading. Yes. Maybe you can explain what that means. Uh, I mean, the Office of Fair Trading is now was a predecessor body for the um, CMA, CMA the, yeah. uh, and uh, some of its functions went off to the FCA, I think, as well. Didn't yes. It? But anyhow, that's all beside the... Yes, well, the, the government used to um, have certain barristers who it would always use for its work, and um, it was quite prestigious to get one of those appointments. So, for example, the Inland Revenue, ha now they have a list because it's so much more work. So they have a list of barristers who they will use. And now the Attorney General also has a list of different levels of barrister, panel A, panel B, panel C. And they will all always go to those barristers to do the work. And that's in order to make sure that the barrister has experience of that kind of work and so knows their way about the relevant legislation um, and uh, also uh, they get quite a bargain on what the fees are charged um, but it is a prestigious it's a prestigious thing to do so I became standing counsel for the director general of fair trading and then for the office of fair trading at that time it was both the competition law side of the work and also consumer credit work so if they needed uh, advice on something or if they needed someone to go to court it would be me uh, who did that work yeah. yes so Vivian your I mean there's an upper trajectory as it were you you have the standing counsel for the OFT you're appearing in the House of Lords you've got this big practice or growing practice and all of a sudden you give it up hmm. I you, did you went into the government legal service I did um, it was it was um, it was quite startling thing to do at the time, um, and I did it because I had a growing realization that I just, despite having wanted to do it for su from such a young age, I was really not cut out to be a barrister, um, even though I was successful at it. Um, I didn't enjoy being in court, and that's a bit of a disadvantage. Um, <laughs> I used to get very nervous before court hearings and although uh, I discovered that lots of people did, they obviously got some kind of compensating buzz from being in court which I didn't get. Um, and I gradually, I, uh, the last case, uh, what turned out to be the last case I did as a barrister was uh, for the Office of Fair Trading but I was led by a wonderful um, QC Ginevra Cause sadly died very prematurely and and uh, when I first started working with her I thought oh she's my role model she was brilliant she was very successful she was absolutely charming uh, and I thought she's my inspiration and that's what I want to be um, and the more I became friendly with her, we were working very closely on this very big case, and she was telling me about what she was doing, what was ahead for her in the next term. And I suddenly realized, actually, that is where I'm heading, and I would be completely wretched if I was living her life. Um, so what should I do? And there was, um, there was a poster in the tube station where I was commuting in and it was an advert for a recruitment and employment agency and the strap line was as you climb the career ladder make sure it's leaning against the right wall and I realized I was climbing up this career ladder and it was not leaning against the right wall and I'd better find a different wall to lean my ladder against so then I had a bit of a crisis of, well what else can I do um, and I debated whether to give up law completely and do something else. But I had some very good careers advice, which was, uh, it's not the law that's the problem, it's being a barrister that's being a problem. So try and find something else to do uh, that uses the law, but in this uh, less confrontational situation. So um, 
by asking around, I discovered the government legal service and applied there and was very happy there. So initially you were in the Treasury? Yes. And um, you worked on quite a, an important piece of legislation. Um, so you might tell yes. about that. So I, I, joined, I joined the government legal service at the beginning of 1996. So that was sort of the last year and a bit of the John Major Conservative administration where they had a very slim parliamentary majority. So they couldn't really do anything exciting. So we just were kind of ticking along, really, keeping the existing regime going. But it became fairly clear fairly soon that in the May 1997 election, there was going to be new Labour coming to power. And they had um, a big uh, agenda um, for change. And John Major, to his credit, could see what was going to happen. So they allowed a lot of um, more contact than was usual with the uh, who one anticipated would be the incoming government and the civil service and one of the things they wanted to do was completely reorganize uh, the way that banks insurance companies and financial services are regulated which was very piecemeal and they wanted to bring it all together in one piece of legislation <laughs> one regulator um, and that was a huge task uh, and so we began to gear up to set up a bill team in the Treasury, which is a mixture of the policy advisors and the lawyers who would then work right from the early days of what is the strategy for this project and then uh, devise the policy from the uppermost strategic levels down to the nitty gritty of what it was going to be, get the bill drafted by parliamentary draftsmen and then uh, pilot the bill through parliament and provide input into all the consultation exercises there were with all the banks, insurance companies and financial services advisors and their clients and their regulators. Uh, so a huge community that needed to have input into what what this new structure was going to be. And that became the Financial Services Market Act. Yes, yeah, 2000. 2000. Yeah. And so did that, you work on that until the I, bill I, was enacted? Or? I almost did. I left just after it had, I think, gone through its almost final stages. I then went to the Attorney General's office, which yeah. is where I met you when yeah. you were Solicitor General. Uh, and but after about six months there, there was a bit of a vacuum created in the team in the Treasury that was needed to um, bring the legislation into effect. So I was called back there because the, the legislation is very sort of open textured with a lot of powers which needed to be filled in by regulations and orders. So, for example, what what financial products are going to be covered by the regime that's not dealt with in primary legislation because it needs to be updated all the time so uh, that the legislation doesn't actually say that so before you can bring the legislation into effect you have to have an order which says what is regulated activity and so uh, I went back to the Treasury with um, Jonathan Jones, who later became mm. Treasury Solicitor, um, and we headed up a different legal team which was responsible for drafting all the orders and statutory instruments over the 18-month period before the Act actually came into effect, was actually commenced. He then spent some time in the Department of Defence. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think you've you extol the virtues of the government legal service. And when I you said I was Solicitor General, which I was, and I thought, you know, lawyers should go and work at the government legal service because they have a huge responsibility, a policy responsibility, and lots of really interesting work. And it's very. It is. But you, you went on and did completely different work. Completely, yes, and, and that, that was another thing that I'd, that was sort of, 
It wasn't only being nervous in court when I left the bar. I'd become very specialised in competition law, and although I really like competition law, I didn't really want to do that for the whole of the rest of my career. And what one thing that the government legal department does offer is that every few years you can change and do something completely different. And it recognises what I think people in practice don't really recognise, that the skills you gain as a lawyer in practice um, are generic skills and you can use them in any legal topic. So if you know how to uh, read and understand cases, you know how to analyse legislation and statutory instruments, you have in your mind a legal lawyer's way of thinking about things, the government really appreciates that you can then turn that to any topic. So the way that you, you build up a a portfolio of skills in the government legal department is not through the topics, it's through the kind of things that you do, being on a bill team, um, drafting statutory instruments, uh, advising other government departments on uh, EU law topics or whatever. Um, and that, that's a kind of a, a very useful skill actually in the judiciary because as you know when you become a judge you are suddenly expected to apply your legal skills to all sorts of areas. Yes. Just um, to go back to defence, mm. what mm. you worked on? So I, I left the, yeah. I left the um, Treasury and joined the Ministry of Defence right at the beginning of 2002. So the main hostilities in Afghanistan were just coming to a close. There were uh, deployments in the Balkans still and various other places um, and it became clear fairly soon that there was going to be another war in the Gulf uh, and so I was there as Director of Operational and International Humanitarian Law um, in the lead up to the March 2003 war and then in the aftermath of that. So you were advising on how the armed services should comply with international yes. humanitarian law? Yes, it was, uh, it was uh, advising on the application of the Geneva Conventions and the other international treaties. Um, it was advising and drafting rules of engagement for the troops in different scenarios um, and on all sorts of things handling prisoners of war um, as a, and also to do with the deployment of the troops in the neighbouring countries um, because whenever a state sends its armed forces into another state uh, there has to be a legal reason otherwise it's a, it's a hostile act um, and so that has to be sorted out and what the status of those forces are going to be when they're there um, in the application of the national law of the country where they are to what they do and that can be quite complicated. And then another complete change because you went to the House of Commons and yes. you uh, were counsel to the Speaker. Yes, so after I'd worked for three and a half years, I think, in the MOD, I then, as you say, went, went on secondment to the Office of Speaker to the House of Commons. And that was an absolutely delightful job, very interesting. Um, the House of Commons is a lovely place to work. And uh, the work is, is a mixture of the kind of work that any big organisation has, so contract disputes, employment disputes, pensions, that kind of thing. <clears throat> the kind of work that any public body has, so judicial reviews, freedom of information, which was actually turned out to be quite a big chunk of my work, and then work that arises specifically because of the nature of the House of Commons, which was particularly intervening in um, legal cases to defend the privileges of the Commons under the Bill of Rights um, of 1689 that whatever happens in the House of Commons must not be questioned or impeached in a court. So 
uh, we sometimes had to intervene in cases where the parties were relying on some statement that had been made uh, by an MP or by someone in, a, in the House or in a select committee and they were proposing to criticise that or say it supported their interpretation of something uh, and we would go roaring in saying, no, 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 don't I, re I represented the Speaker on that occasion on the Neil Hamilton case in, ah, in yes. the House of Lords. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, we must move on quickly. Mm. Um, you then became a judge, or a, a, yes. a part-time judge. Yes. Well, the good thing about the House of Commons job was it was three days a week. Um, and uh, because by that, when I left practice, my one regret really was that it meant I would never be a judge. Because at that time, uh, it was only senior barristers who became judges. And um, I had a very difficult balance to make. Should I stick it out being rather miserable as a barrister for however many years in the hope that I might eventually be made a judge? And I decided no. Um, but whilst I was working in the government legal services, there was a whole revolution as to how judges are appointed. Uh, and the pool of lawyers who were able to be appointed to be judges was opened up to be, include government lawyers. And then I knew that was what I wanted to do. Um, but I was then a kind of fairly lowly grade five lawyer in the Ministry of Defence, which was not a good jumping off point. So I had, it took me eight years to reorient everything to a different wall for my ladder um, to get myself into a position to apply to be a High Court judge, which eventually I did. And the first step of that was to move to work part-time and apply for a judicial post. And you became a member of the CAD? Yes, I became a judge on the Competition Appeal Tribunal. But again, it was fortunate that the area of law that I specialised in had a tribunal which I could join. It was also fortunate that Christopher Bellamy was by that time president of the Competition Appeal Tribunal. Um, and I went to see him and said, you know, do you think I've got any prospect of this? And he said, well, when we have a vacancy, throw your hat in the ring, which I did. And um, that was my first judicial appointment. So for three, I didn't want to cut my ties completely with the government because um, I didn't know whether the judging would suit me. Um, so I worked three years part-time in, in the House of Commons and part-time as a judge. And you also became a recorder, which uh, is a, a part-time, mm. it was four, day, uh, four weeks a year at one yeah. point, where you're trying criminal cases. Yes. Um, and you did that for a couple of years? I did that, yes, quite briefly. I never really got to do anything more serious than a bonk on the head or two wraps of cocaine but um, it was it was fascinating um, and I felt that it shouldn't really go through a whole career as a lawyer without having any contact with the criminal law so I applied to be a recorder yes and then you applied to be a high court judge I did yes, yes. and you went through the competition and, the, and became a, a chancery judge Yes, I mean, um, competition law was, is, and it still is chancery business. So the chancery division is a kind of collection of vaguely connected specialisms, insolvency, intellectual property, company law, uh, and competition law. Um, so they were looking for a competition law stroke public law specialist. So I thought, well, that looks as if I'm the right person for that. So I applied, yes. And did you enjoy the job? I loved it. Mm. I absolutely loved it. I was a bit worried that when I started the judging that I would get terribly nervous and I would suffer the same problems as I had as a barrister. But whether I was just that bit older and a bit more chill or whether... It's, it's a very different kind of stress, I think, as a judge. Um, so but yes, charge. you're in charge. If you change your mind halfway through, that's fine. Um, uh, and uh, no one's horrible to you. They have to be nice. They to have you. to be nice to you. <laughs> and um, uh, yes, I loved it. The moment I started, I thought, this is for me. Yes, I loved my time in the Chancery Division. Yeah. 
<laughs> so it's such a mixture. Could I ask? Yeah. Was that better than being on the Supreme Court? Oh, no. I'm very, I'm by nature very ambitious, and I do, um, I do, I mean, I, I kind of envy people who just stay as a High Court judge, and that's what they know they want to do, and they, they do that for the whole of their career. But that's not my temperament. I know myself well enough that after five, six years, when I see all my cohort all going up to the Court of Appeal, if I'm not going up to the Court of Appeal, I'll be very grumpy. So, so what are you going to do after the Supreme Court? <laughs> oh, I don't think I'm going to do anything very much after the Supreme Court. I am where I am, I think. That's, the, that's where I'll stay. Well, look, I said we'd talk <laughs> for about, chat for about 50 minutes. I think it is about 50 minutes. Okay. So let's pause and ask whether there are any questions from any of the students. So what I'll do, I'll take a couple of questions together. So now we want to record this. Um, we had the microphone on. Oh, great. Perfect. Don't take too many together, because I've had and quite a long day, and I won't remember them <laughs> before. Yes. Yeah, well, we'll so, take just, the yes, yeah. so tell us who you yeah. are, what, what you are, and yeah. Um, so I'm Yusuf. I'm studying PPE, so not law, but law's too, it's too interesting to give it a miss. Um, my question is in two parts, if that's okay. Firstly, it's about, so I think it's incredible how we've seen a lot more female uh, Supreme Court justices, of course, Lady Hale, uh, you now. Um, do you think we'd be able to see any non-white Supreme Court justices um, in the future? Um, and my second part is, is it's interesting to see the difference between Supreme Court justices in America compared to here. What do you think, well, do you think it might be a good idea to have politicians elect Supreme Court justices in this country um, to mimic what it's like in America? Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much. And then we'll have that one up there. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, it was an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, and and, and I, I'm, I'm studying on the LLM. Uh, I'm an exchange student from the United States. Uh, my, my, my question was going to be quite similar, actually, um, related to the politica politicization of, of American courts. And, you know, if, if, if first of all, if you, if you have seen something like that developing in the UK, um, and if not, you know, if, if, if you would have any thoughts as to, as to how to prevent it, because it seems like in the US, just running towards this, this ever increasing politicization of, of the entire judicial system. Um, and so, yeah. Okay. Uh, the first point, the um, diversity point, yes, I hope that in future there will be um, more women justices on the court and ethnic minority judges. I think that the the position has changed or the attitudes of people have changed beyond all recognition from when I started out and I was the first woman member of my set of chambers. Um, and I think at that time, there was no recognition really that it was a problem that there was no diversity or that there was any value of, in diversity. And women in, in my position who were just starting in chambers and in the other branches of profession as well, um, you got by just by it being completely ignored that you were any different from anybody else. And that was how you had to behave. But I think that now there is, uh, and if you, know, you had suggested to judges or senior barristers in those days that this might actually be a problem, a problem that they had some responsibility for addressing and that there was some uh, benefit to having different life experience being brought to being a lawyer, they would have been completely baffled by that kind of thing. So now I think the attitudes are very different. Uh, it's taking time for change to happen, but I hope that it does. I hope that it does happen. And I don't think. Um, I, I think it's part partly the difficulty here is that. Um, you become a judge at the end of a career and uh, the pool from which 
people are being drawn is not terribly diverse, but that is changing. And one of the things that is helping it to change is that there is more um, promotion from uh, other benches, the district bench and the circuit bench up into the senior judiciary and also movement across from the tribunals into the court service and sort of more interaction of those two services. And those, those pools of people are much more diverse and so that I think is helping. Um, on the question of the politicization, uh, I don't think any of that, I mean, it's difficult because it's a topic um, in the public eye at the moment. I don't sense here, certainly not amongst the judiciary, and I don't sense that there's any uh, appetite um, amongst politicians particularly to have political input into the appointment of judges here. Um, I don't think that people look at other judicial appointment systems and think, goodness, aren't those working so much better than ours? Um, so I don't, I don't see that. I think you, you do hear about it sometimes, uh, and I think a lot of it uh, stems from a misunderstanding of constitutional checks and balances uh, and of the role of judges and the judiciary that they're not elected, but they don't, they're a, a different aspect of the constitutional checks and balances from the um, elected legislature and from the executive. Um, so I think that quite a lot of discussion is, is, a, is slightly um, misinformed by a misunderstanding of how that whole balance is supposed to work. Some more questions. There's someone over here, yes. And who else? Over here, great, good. Hi. Um, the, my, my question is slightly similar to, <laughs> sorry. Just tell us who you are. Yeah, um, oh, hi, I'm, I'm Jay Work. I'm a, a LLB student here. Um, the question I had was on the role of the Lord Chancellor. That's slightly before, you know, the time you became a Supreme Court Justice. But um, I've always found this idea of the kind of tripartite nature of the Lord, traditionally of the Lord Chancellor, of being political, judicial, and, leg uh, and legislative, and the kind of input that he could provide to the different branches of government. Um, I, I don't know whether you'd be allowed to have a public view on this, um, or, or whether indeed you'd have any view on it, um, since it, it's already happened. Um, but I, I, I was wondering what your views on that was in the in the context of the British Constitution, because I, I, th I think the kind of American um, urge to separate the branches um, was a little bit alien to to here anyway. Sorry. So, the dean should not be carrying the microphone. <laughs> Sometimes I hear, but I do a very good job. Don't you do. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Cheyenne Peng. Thank you for uh, having us here tonight. Uh, I really want to ask a non-law question. During that 80 years, when you were re trying to uh, switch your career, go back then, and what was the book that really influenced you? when make you keep going, because eight years is a really long time, wasn't it? And another question I really want to know as a female judge, and I really like what you said. Back then it was ignored. There's, yeah, I think it really made me have a deep thought. And uh, who, was, who, who was or is your role model? Um, right, okay, yes, there. all right. Well, starting with the Lord Chancellor, that, that was a body which did have that slightly anomalous tripartite role and that was the um, one of the reasons why the um, Constitutional Reform Act broke up that role and quite a lot of the responsibilities of the Lord Chancellor um, were passed to the Lord Chief Justice um, and that has had uh, a very significant effect 
on the role of the Lord Chief Justice, which is now has a huge administrative component, and also um, involves a lot of a lot of members of the judiciary in having a lot more what in a company would be called sort of corporate responsibility roles. Um, because a lot of what used to be done by the Lord Chancellor and the Ministry of Justice now is done by the, the Lord Chief <coughs> Justice and the judiciary. And so most High Court judges uh, do have some role in addition to their actual court work of sitting on committees. Um, I, for example, was um, President of the um, Tax and Chancery Chamber of the Upper Tribunal. Uh, and there are all sorts of different committees that judges sit on in addition to their actual court work. Um, so it has had a big influence on, um, on that. Uh, of course, at the time, it wasn't necessarily foreseen that people who were not lawyers would be appointed to be Secretary of State for Justice and Lord Chancellor. Um, uh, or that there would be uh, quite such frequent changes in the appointment. And that, that is just a function of, of um, how government has traditionally worked, um, which is really what, what the civil service and the lawyers reflect, which is that they all move around and they're all expected to kind of pick up the brief very quickly. And that's why they have the civil service to help them. So it has had... Uh, quite a big influence on the on the way that the judiciary is is governed. Yes, um, and so there was the role models. Oh yes, and... role models. <laughs> um, I've had a number of role models. Of course, uh, the women who have gone before, from Millicent Garrett Fawcett onwards to more recent women in the judiciary, um, have been very influential. Uh, in my in my life, um, as to uh, you know seeing how to how to do the job, um, and I think your your question about the how how long it took me to organise, um, I mean I did enjoy all the things I did in the meantime. I enjoyed working in the House of Commons and, and uh, as a as a tribunal judge. Um, but I do, I do like to make it clear to groups that I, I have been quite deliberate in the planning of my career um, because I think too often people say, oh, I was so lucky, this popped up, this popped up. And I, luck did play quite an important role in what jobs came up at what time. But I, I did kind of manage my career in quite a deliberate way. And I have been quite ambitious. Um, so I did realize that if I wanted to eventually become a high court judge, I needed to have a part I needed to have a part time role uh, as a judge. Um, I needed to get a spot on a something I knew on a tribunal I knew something about. So uh, as well as um, joining the um, uh, House of Commons, I volunteered to edit the edition, the forthcoming edition of Bellamy and Child, which is the sort of leading practitioner's textbook, and that then enabled me to um, get back into learning all the competition law that had happened whilst I'd been in the, in the GLD. So um, I did kind of quite deliberately put the um, put the pieces in place to get where I wanted to be. So we've got another question. Well, let's take over there, David. We'll take those two there, and then there's one over here. So we'll take three, and then I think we might, we might um, call okay. it a day. Thank you very much. My name is Sevad Marciniuk, first year law student of undergrad. Thank you for your speech and insights about legal career and legal profession. You collected a few important points that you were lucky with your seniors during your beginning of your career and the middle part of your career. And I wanted to ask us the question, maybe the most important for all students who are just starting their career. How to select the mentor 
and how not to lose yourself when you're following someone as a role model. Thank you. And then there's someone just there. Yep. Hi, my name is Salah. I'm on the LLM program. Uh, my question is regarding the tangible impact of your work on many aspects of human life, particularly during your work at the Defense Ministry and now at the Supreme Court. Um, how difficult is it to stay within constitutional bounds whilst ensuring that the impact is on the whole positive? Thanks much. Do you want to take the third one? Uh, no, I'll, I'll answer those. So I'll answer those, John, then we'll yes. I, I, yes, I think mentoring is something that's kind of much more um, an idea now than when I was starting out. It was much more kind of informal if it existed at all. I think that the important thing is to choose someone who um, is close enough to what you're doing to be able to um, uh, be able to advise you. So sometimes st students ask if I would be their mentor or people just at bar school. And I say, well, no, it's all changed so much since I was there. I don't really know how the system works other than in a very broad sense. Um, but I have, I have sort of formally mentored someone of people but mostly at the sort of people who are t coming towards the end of their careers or they're, they're quite senior because that is something I feel I can help about but it's um, I think that if you if I don't know whether the the university provides that kind of programming but certainly if you I think if you join, if you think you're going to the bar and join one of the inns of court, I think they would be able to help you. Uh, and I think if you, um, went, once you start working somewhere as a pupil barrister or as a trainee in a firm of solicitors, you will quite quickly find somebody who you feel sort of in tune with um, and just ask them if to give you some advice on something and then if you find that helpful you might suggest that you formalize it in, in a way I mean the thing about mentoring is that you have to, as the mentor you have to um, uh, refrain from saying all right I know your problem this is what you need to do X Y and Z because the idea is to encourage the person to come to their own conclusions as to what they want to do so that is really the per kind of person that you should be looking for. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, yes, I think certainly in the government legal service and, and as a judge, not just in the Supreme Court, you have to be very aware of the impact of what you do um, on uh, the people affected. Um, and in the Supreme Court, of course, we only take cases which have an arguable point of law of general public importance. So necessarily everything we do, we take because it uh, has wider repercussions. Um, once you get involved in the case or involved in giving the piece of advice, um, I find that whatever preconceptions you may have come to the problem with, as to how where you think you ought to end up, they tend to kind of dissipate because you become involved in the studying what the law is, working out what the law is, and how it then going to apply to these facts. Um, and so by the end of the process, I think for me, I have kind of shed any extraneous considerations about what I as an individual might have thought was the right or the wrong answer. And I think that also, once you become an experienced lawyer, certainly you have a kind of gut feel as to what the answer is likely to be. But then your guts have been a lawyer's guts for quite a long time. And um, that actually is a product of your legal training and the application of your legal experience. And I think I discovered that quite a lot when I was sitting as a tribunal judge, because you sit with two lay people, 
who are very experienced economists or um, hydrologists. I had in one series of cases I did, and they bring a different expertise. Um, but it's surprising how often something that I think of as a sort of procedural fairness point that you would have thought would everyone would think that. Actually, they have a very different idea. And the fact that it, my gut reaction is X is actually because I've been a lawyer for a long time now. Um, uh, and so I think that that is how it feeds through to the decision-making process. I promised a final question up there. Was it there? Yes. Well, just, to... just shout it out. Yeah, okay, sure. Um, hi, I'm Priyansh. I'm a first year LLB student. And I think uh, we've all come here to talk about law. We've talked about a lot of law. But I kind of want to bring you back to one of the things you mentioned right at the start. Um, you mentioned you're a big fan of theater. Well, so am I. I think a lot of people in this room might be. I'd like to know what's the best theatrical production of all time. You have no qualifiers. What's the best one? <laughs> um, oh, goodness me. <laughs> Well, last night I went to see Othello at the National Theatre, um, and it is very good. But a few years ago, I went to see the production. It was also at the National Theatre with Adrian Lester as Othello, and I think it was Rory Kinnear um, as Iago. And that was just astonishing. And I remember... It was one of the few, uh, it, was, it was an amazing, gripping thing, even though, of course, you know what's going to happen. And I remember in that production, at the, the beginning of the final scene, the stagehands came on and they wheeled forward the bed. And there was just this reaction from the audience, this just kind of visceral groan from the whole of the audience seeing this being wheeled on and of course knowing the terrible events that were going to unfold and it was just such a an experience of collective anticipatory grief in a way that was engendered by this performance and it was an amazing moment and there are sometimes moments where you just feel this connection with the drama um, I remember many, many years ago seeing Judy Dench in a play. And she came forward to the front of the stage to deliver. It was a, a modern play, a soliloquy. And just almost everyone leant forward in their seat because they were just, and I was, so gripped by feeling she was really talking to me. Um, and I think those are the, are the great moments of theatre of um, this collective uh, experience of this cathartic <coughs> moment. So those are two that spring to mind. That's a great last question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful last question, a wonderful answer. Lady, Lady Rose, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. It's been a wonderful conversation about your life and, and your career. And you've had over 100 spellbound students in here. <laughs> I think you learned so much about the importance of fashioning a legal career that fits to who you are as a person. So thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you. So everyone, you're invited to a drinks reception.